Go ahead and get your Bibles and open to 1 John chapter 2. We'll be finding our text there today uh, in just a few minutes. 1 John chapter 2. For those of you that are visiting with us, we've been looking at the gospel of 1 John and not doing it uh, specifically as though we're breaking down verse by verse and chapter by chapter in that sort of a way, but through a specific uh, mindset or lens that John himself provides at the end of the book when he tells the people that he's writing to to keep themselves away from idols. Uh, When we look at that idea of an idol, what we found is that idols are really, when you think about it, when you look up the definition of the word, things that are tied up in the idea of worship and falseness. So when we hold false ideas uh, about who God is, about who Jesus is, uh, about the trueness of their character, and then we claim to worship uh, Jesus or we claim to worship God, but we have those false notions, uh, then really we're worshiping an idol God, but not the true God as he's presented in the scripture. And that appears to be what John is concerned with uh, as he's writing this letter uh, to his first century readers, uh, that there were certain ideas that were creeping in, and specifically we'll see, not necessarily even creeping sometimes, but specifically being pushed on them uh, by the world around them uh, that were leading to these false notions of who God was, or specifically, as we'll see today, uh, who the Christ was, who Jesus was. And so uh, that's what we want to be looking at today. We've looked at some of these that we found so far, uh, this idea that God perhaps is somewhat like me, that there may be some darkness mixed, mixed in with God. Uh, and we, we do that or we think that when we treat him uh, in a certain way or when we live a certain way, but then say we have fellowship with God and we're following him, but we're not doing the things that he asks. That's a false God uh, that we claim to worship. Uh, we've seen that the idea that God is somehow disinterested. They doesn't really care about how I lead my life or what I do. Uh, and when we think that and we talk to people who will directly espouse that, you will find people who say God doesn't care how I live my life or God doesn't care how I talk or God doesn't care this, that, or the other. Uh, that's a false idea of who God is. Uh, we've seen the idea that God doesn't care perhaps how I treat or whether or not I love my brother, that I can say I love God and yet I can be completely disinterested in all of you or I can uh, do things that are either specifically hurtful to you or just not do anything at all for you when you have need and think that that's okay and that's not what John tells us is true about God that we find in the scripture. Last time we looked at the idea that God uh, is somehow this God of the world and that seems like a good idea that God created everything and God is in control of everything and so God is the God of this world. But when we look at the idea we find in John chapter 2, what we discover is that there are things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that are not from God. Those things do not come from him. And when we give in to those things, we are really serving a different God, uh, Satan himself, who brings those things to us as though they are things that God has given us and should be indulged in. What we want to look at today, then, is what we find Uh, down at the end, really, of 1 John chapter 2, and it starts in verse 18. Uh, Verses 18 through 27 is where we'll find our text today, Uh, and it's quite a title that's fairly sensational. If you you see that, you think, whoa, man, this is going to be an exciting, the Antichrist, right? That's that's big stuff right there, but we're going to look at this idea today and see what John has to say about it. Let's pick up the reading in verse 18. It says, Little children, it is now the last time, and as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, by which we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and you know that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist and denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, the same has not the Father. Let us therefore abide in you, which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning them that seduce you, But the anointing which you have received of him abides in you, and you do not need that any man would teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. When we look at this passage, we see this idea introduced here in the letter that John is writing about these things or these people called the Antichrist. Now, if you go out and you do a search on the web about the Antichrist, you're going to find all kinds of really good stuff. 
I mean, it is sensational. It is fantastic. There have been movies made about it. It, it is an exciting, exciting topic when you go out and you search that on the web. But what we need to understand is first what the Antichrist is not. What the Antichrist is not is not what you're going to see in a Hollywood depiction of the Antichrist. If you go out and you did a search on all the movies that contain the idea of the Antichrist, what you're going to find typically is that the Antichrist is somehow the human spawn of Satan coming to earth and being born, much as Jesus was born in some way, right? That Satan himself impregnates a woman and she gives birth to the Antichrist. That he's somehow half devil, half demon, has sorts of powers, all kinds of great things that makes for exciting, exciting movies with titles like The End of Days and good things like that. Lots of explosions, lots of special effects, great stuff. That's not what we see written about here, though, when John talks about the Antichrist. Sometimes you'll see this idea that the Antichrist is some antagonist that's going to appear at the end of time uh, in the Battle of Armageddon. Right? And again, you can find movies about this. You can find books written about this idea. The Antichrist is the main antagonist at the great battle at the end of days known as Armageddon. We don't see that talked about here as well. In fact, the Antichrist also is not a futuristic, highly detailed, singular person that the scripture reveals to us. In fact, if you go and you look for this idea of Antichrist, the only person who ever uses it in the scripture is John himself. And he uses it uh, several times here and once we'll look at uh, in 2 John in just a moment. But that's the idea of who the Antichrist is that the world has today when you go out and you talk to people about him. Most of those ideas are, are pure fiction, and the ones that are somehow based in something tend to come uh, from a conglomeration of ideas, some from Revelation, uh, some from other letters of Paul, where they pull these ideas together, and they put them all in a single person, and they call him the Antichrist. Most of those ideas do not appear anywhere in any sort of historical literature till about the late second, early third century. That's the first time you'll start to get these ideas being conglomerated into a single person known as the Antichrist in the religious world. So when we want to find out then who the Antichrist is and why uh, it's important to our study of John, especially the second chapter, let's dial in on those verses 18 and 19 where he's talked about there for just a minute. What we find out in verses 18 and 19, first of all, uh, is this idea that the Antichrist is not some future manifestation that's going to come down the line. In fact, when we look in verse 18 and 19, we see that they are present at the time of the writing. Now, did John write this sometime in the future? No, he couldn't have because we're reading it right now, right? That's just basic common sense. So if John did not write this in the future from now, then that means the Antichrist is not coming in the future. So he says what? He says they have already appeared, past tense. They're already present in John's day. There it means to us that Antichrist has come and many of them have died thousands of years before we came on the scene. They've already appeared. They've already been that way. Uh, there is evidence, he says, that this is currently the last hour. John says the fact that they're around right now points to something about his present day, doesn't it? He says their fact that they are here, this is how we know that it is the last time, that it is the last hour. If they were sometime in the future, John would not point to them to say, this is how we know that today is a certain thing. And he says something interesting as well, past tense, that they went out from us. Again, we see this idea of the past tense. They have already done this thing. And who did they go out from? He says they went out from us. It means John is including himself and whoever they went out from. Is John still alive here today? No. And that means they couldn't have gone out from him in the future. It's happened in the past. Now who is this us that they've gone out from? Well I think the idea that John is driving at probably goes back to John, uh, 1 John chapter 1 in the introduction verses 1 through 3. Back there John says this is that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and which was manifested where? Unto us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you have fellowship with 
us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus the Christ. So when we look at this idea of Antichrist, it says they went out from us. And the us that John seems to be concerned about in this letter is the witnesses, right? Those people that he talks about at the beginning, that says, we walked with Jesus. We saw him, we handled him, we heard him. He was with us. That would be those eyewitnesses. Specifically, he probably has in mind the apostles that walked and talked with Jesus and were sent out on a special mission to bear witness of him. And what John says is the Antichrist is not of us. But specifically, he says, they went out from us. They used to be with us. They hung around us. They were near us. There were people here that we taught, that we talked with, that we knew that left and went somewhere else. And notice the importance that he places then on staying with us. John has an importance here. He says, when they went out from us, when they left us, that was for the purpose so that everybody could see that's not who we are. That's not us. That's not what the true witness is about. That's not what the message that Jesus has brought is all about. That is against Christ. It's anti-Christ. When he lays that idea out, you know what? It's really not as exciting as I thought it might have been, does it? I mean, I was looking forward to special effects and fantastic and great future prophecies and all these exciting things. But John says, look, you want to know who Antichrist is? Antichrist is those who left us. They went out. They left. They went somewhere else. And you know where they've gone now? It sounds like they've gone to John's readers is what it sounds like. It sounds like they've come to them and they're bringing them some doctrine that they want to talk about. More about that in just a minute. Let's understand though why this is important to us today if this happened way back in the days of John. Look again at verses 20 through 22. John is talking to his readers of that day and he has certain important things that they need to understand but really they center around something very important and a theme that we've already seen again and again in this letter of 1 John and that is this idea of lies versus truth. There it is again, right? That idea that that which is false is idol. That which we hold as false and worship is somehow idolatry. And here we have falseness presented again and is contrasted with that which is truth. He says, you know all things. I've not written to you because you do not know what? The truth. But because you do know the truth. And you know that no lie can be of the truth. There was a lie that was being presented to those people in John's day about Jesus. And what was that lie that was being presented to them in that day? We'll look at verse 22. It says, who is the liar? Who is the liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? And what's he say right after that? He is Antichrist. The Antichrist is that which denies that Jesus is the Christ. And by doing that, it says he denies both the Father and the Son. And that's a big, important idea for us, this idea of denying that Jesus is the Christ. I said we'd look at the other places where uh, we find the term or the word Antichrist used. Uh, let's turn and look at those now. If you just flip over probably a page, maybe two in your Bible, you'll find the next uh, occurrence where John uses it in this letter. It's in chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3. In 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, John says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are from God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And hereby you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, of which you have heard that it should come, and even now, is already in the world. When we find this idea again here, just a few chapters later in this uh, letter that John has written, we see again this idea the Antichrist is already out in the world, and there's a certain spirit about the Antichrist, or uh, we would say this is the Antichrist message, and it's very similar to what we found in chapter 2, right? In chapter 2, John says, the person who denies that Jesus is the Christ is Antichrist. Here he says something very similar. He says, this one that does not confess... Jesus, the one that does not confess Jesus, is Antichrist. And there appears to be a specific sort of piece there as well, uh, this idea that Jesus has come in 
the flesh, that he actually physically manifested and came down here. There was a Jesus, that Jesus was here, and that while he was here, he was the Christ, physically, literally, on the planet. He says there are those that are denying that that is the case. Now, the other occurrence that we see of this is in uh, the second uh, letter of John, the book we call Second John, uh, in chapter 1, obviously, it's only one chapter long, but it's down in verses 6 through 9. In 2 John 1, verses 6 through 9, John has this to say. He says, This is love, that we walk after his commands, and this is the command, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers have entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have worked for, but that we should receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. And he that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Again, we see this idea here where there are those who have gone out, who is a deceiver, who tells a lie, who says things that are not true, that spreads falseness. And the falseness that he says here is that Jesus Christ has not come in the flesh. This is the Antichrist. Now, when we look at this, that's a problem. And the problem is, because we just had the reading for us only a few minutes, uh, 10 minutes or so ago now, in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, what did it have to say about all of this here? It said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? And then what does it say about that Word? It says, the Word became flesh, and he dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. We saw him. He was here. He manifested himself in the flesh. And then he says about that, that that person was Jesus the Christ, who brought us grace and truth. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus the Christ. So John says, there's something I've delivered to you. There's something that you've heard. There's something that you had before that was very specific. And now there are deceivers that have gone out that said, this is not true. That's not the case. Now, specifically in John's day, it seems like that was a direct, specific doctrine that was being taught to them. Jesus Christ did not come in the flesh. Or Jesus was not the Christ that we see in chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2. Now, we look around us today and we say, well, that's not a problem for us. Surely we're not suggesting that we worship the Antichrist. In fact, we hardly ever use that term anyway, right? We, we don't have this mindset among us that Jesus did not come in the flesh. We don't have this mindset among us where we do not confess Jesus as the Christ. We do that all the time. This is not our problem. This was their problem. Where we run into our idolatry is when we follow after that spirit by living as though... Jesus did not come in the flesh. There are times when I go through my week, when I go along my way, and I don't think about Jesus at all. When I go and I take my actions, when I decide what I'm going to do, do I stop and do I think, how should I do this based on the fact that Jesus came in the flesh? That he lived, that he taught, that he probably went through something very similar to this, that he died for my sins. When I don't think about Jesus in that way when I live my life, aren't I just denying that he came at all? If he has no impact on my day to day, what does it matter if he was here? When I go about living that particular way where I don't think of Jesus as my Lord, aren't I denying Jesus is the Christ? I mean, what does it mean when we say that Jesus is the Christ anyway? What does that term mean, the Christ? Christ means the anointed one. When we think about the anointed one, what does that mean? It means it was that one that was selected by God. Oftentimes it has in mind this idea of lordship or kingship. Go look at anointings in the Bible. What's the most often case where that happens? Perhaps when God is picking a king. When we live like Jesus is not our king, we live as though he's not the Christ. And when we do that, we deny who Jesus is. And we serve and worship a false Jesus. Now that's important to us because John has something very important to say in verses 23 through 25 that we read a minute ago, right? About denying the Christ. There's importance in denying the Son. 
The importance that we find in denying the Son is threefold. First, he says, whoever denies the Son, the same does not have the Father. That's a problem. The Son and the Father, John says, are intertwined. You can't have one without the other. Now, there are religious traditions out there today. There are people that you will talk to today that will specifically run counter to this. They will say, Jesus is not the Christ. Jesus was a good man. Jesus was a prophet. There are religions out there that say, Jesus was a guy. He was a prophet from God. But he was not the Christ, but we still have the Father. We still worship the same God you worship, just Jesus is not the Christ. John says, that's a no-go. That's an impossibility. If you don't have the Son, you don't get the Father. You can't take one without the other. He says in 24, let that thing which abides in you, which you heard from the beginning. There's an importance here, something that needs to abide in us. There is a first teaching, something from the beginning that they heard. And he says about that, if you do... You'll remain in the Father and in the Son. If you want to abide in the Father and the Son, if you want to remain in them, there's a first teaching, there's a primary thing that you have to hang on to. What do you think that is? What do you suppose that first thing is that he wants them to understand? What is the first thing they came to understand when they decided to become Christian? It can only be one thing. That is that Jesus is the Christ, right? I mean, if I deny that, if I don't have that, if I let go of that primary thing, I can't abide, I can't continue to abide in the Father and in the Son. In fact, if we go back to chapter 1 again, that's what John had said, right? We declared this thing to you, that thing that we saw, that we heard, that we handled ourselves so that you can have fellowship with Father and Son. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, you can't abide in them. And importantly, he says in verse 25, this is the promise that he's promised us. So if you're not in them, if you don't have the Father and the Son, if you don't abide in the Father and the Son, you don't get this promise. And what's the promise that he's promised? Eternal life. He says, this is that which he promised to us, eternal life. There's an importance to accepting and to knowing, to living and to confessing that Jesus is the Christ. It's eternal life. It's a matter of life and of death. Now that seems like a pretty simple idea and something that no one would have any problem with at all. And yet, John wrote it to these people. He was concerned about people coming and taking and grabbing on to this idea that the Antichrists were presenting. And so it's important for us in verses 26 and 27 to look at this idea of deceivers and teachings. He says, these things I've written to you concerning those that deceive you, that seduce you, that lead you astray, the different translations say. Now that's an interesting idea, isn't it? I mean, notice what it doesn't say. It's a very small change, but notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say, these things I have written to you concerning those that try to seduce you that try to deceive you, that try to lead you astray. It says there are people that have come to you and they've pulled you off already. They've seduced you. They've led you astray. They've deceived you. He said, I wrote these things about those people, and then he wants them to understand something about themselves. Now, let's think about what's going on here. What he's saying is there were people who had come to his readers. There are people that had come to those that John is talking to. There are people that are coming to the people that John says, you are my little children. And what he says is they brought you something new. They brought you something different. They brought you some teaching that they said, you need this. I know you've heard that, but we've got something you need to receive. You need to take this in. You need to make it part of who you are and what you believe about Jesus. Jesus is not the Christ. Jesus did not come in the flesh. That's not really how it went. We have this new teaching that you need to take. Now what John says about that, though, he says, there's nothing that you need from them. 
There's no new teaching that you need to receive. There's nothing new that you need from those people. And the same can be said for us today. All the time, aren't people saying, there's a new thing we know about Jesus. There's a new thing we need to understand about what he wants for you in your life. There's a new thing that Jesus says, a different thing than we've understood before. Times have changed. Things are different. We've got to get with the program, and Jesus would be happy if we did. In fact, Jesus loves this. Look, go back and see. It's right here. See? We missed it all this time. John says, you don't need any of that stuff. Why? Well, it's in verse 27, isn't it? In verse 27, he says, you've already received an anointing from him. You see, the problem that the disciples were having, that the uh, early Christians were having that were being talked to by John here, is that people were coming and saying, you don't have it. You don't have the anointing. God hasn't chosen you. You're not selected. You're not special. You don't have a relationship with him. You've lost that because you need our new teaching. John says, you don't need their new teaching. You've already got what they said you don't have. You've already got it. You've got the anointing already. He says, you don't need what they have to tell you because you've already got a teacher. You don't need a new teacher. You don't need an antichrist teacher. You don't need a new one because you already have a teacher. He says, the one that teaches you is the anointing that you've already been given. It teaches you these things. Now, again, when we think about this idea of the anointing, the important piece for us to understand here is that he says, the anointing you've received, what you've already got, what Jesus has already given you, has already taught you all you need to know. Now, when I think about how did I receive Jesus, how did I come to know who Jesus was? How did I come to understand him? And how did I come to be in a relationship with him? How did I come to receive his anointing? Wasn't it by the things that I heard? Wasn't it by the things that I read? Wasn't it by the things that I was taught from the scriptures of him? Wasn't it from those things that the apostles had laid down for us to understand about Jesus? What else do I need? What other teaching could there be that I'm missing out on? There isn't one. And he says, finally, understand this. The thing that you've got, it's the truth. You've already got it. Look, if what the apostles had to say to those people was already the truth, then anything else that I add must be what? It must be a lie. It must be falsehood. It must not be the case. They couldn't say this new teaching we're bringing you coincides with what you already understand. Because what it was is Jesus has not come in the flesh. Jesus is not the Christ. He says, look, if you've got the truth, everything else has to be a lie. And we don't need lies. We don't need to worship lies. We don't need to hold on to those things. What we need to do is hold on instead to the truth we've already received. And finally, he says, you don't need some new teaching because the original teaching was this. Abide in me. The original teaching they had, the thing that they had already been taught, the thing that he says this is of primary importance to you is Jesus said, abide in me. Right? Isn't there a parable that he told about the vine and the branches? He said, abide in me. And now new people are coming along and saying, don't do that. Go somewhere else. Come over here. Jesus said, abide in me. And John says, you don't need a new teaching. Because the teaching you have already says, don't do that. That's not a good idea. Stay in me. I have eternal life. Let's go to God in prayer. Our God and our Father, we come to you and we thank you for uh, this word that you've given us and this time that we could open it up and study from it. Uh, we're so thankful, Father, that you have preserved it down through the ages for us to understand because we know that there are many uh, false ideas that have crept into the world specifically about Jesus and who he is, uh, what he's done where he came from, the life that he lived here on this earth, uh, the fact that he is Lord and King and anointed by you. Father, we're so thankful that you have preserved for us uh, the truth of this matter so that when these false doctrines come up, when these ideas appeared even uh, so many centuries ago as they were back when John was writing this, we can go back to your word and we can find that we already have the teaching that we need. We already have that which was uh, given to us by Jesus, that was given to us by the witnesses that saw him and heard him and talked with him. Uh, and we can see that those false ideas about who Jesus is, those false ideas that Jesus is not the Christ, are just that, that they're a lie. 
and that we don't need those things. But instead, we need to abide in him as he told us, and that we do that. We confess him in our lives and with our mouths that he is Lord in Christ, uh, that we have both him as the Son and you as the Father. And we know that that gives us eternal life. Father, we're thankful that we can come to you in this way and bring this need to you at this time, that uh, we need you to help us to abide in that truth. We need you to help us to deny those who would deny you. We need to take a stand for who you are and who he was. And that we need to live our lives in a way that would reflect uh, this belief that we hold in our hearts. Father, we pray that as we go out now uh, into the world again, that you would help us to take that strong stance with us, that we would daily confess Jesus as Lord, not only with our mouths, but also with our actions, Father. We thank you for this way that we can come to you and through Jesus' sacrifice that makes it possible. In his name we pray. Amen.